Hi, I'm Dr. Peter Pasek. I retired this past September after 43 years in plastic surgery. And I feel that I've had a great run. I've had wonderful patients and I've really enjoyed my practice. During the last 10 years, I've been very involved with vaginismus, developing a program for treating vaginismus, writing a book, writing scientific papers, and advocating for women. And this is why even after my retirement, I'm still advocating for women with vaginismus. So what I'm planning to do is I'm planning to discuss vaginismus so that you better understand vaginismus, so that you can understand the various treatments of vaginismus. And one of the things that I've been working on for the past year is trying to help my patients do a self-evaluation to see how severe the vaginismus is and perhaps what kind of therapy might be most suitable. The questions that I get frequently in my practice is what is vaginismus? And do I have vaginismus? Can I be treated for vaginismus? How is it going to be possible for me to have a baby and raise a family? And do I need professional treatment or can I overcome this myself? So many of my patients have tried dilators for years and years and years, physical therapy for years, and not made any progress. So perhaps by understanding how to do a self-evaluation, you'll better understand what types of treatment might be suitable for you. And I plan to go into all of this. Any doctor that starts a new type of a program has to get institutional review board approval and then FDA approval. And so I went through this process. It took me two years. Uh, to get my IRB approval, and I got FDA approval for the continued research in vaginismus using Botox, and then I also received investigational new drug approval. So the first question we need to ask is, what is vaginismus? We need to define vaginismus. And vaginismus is more than just simply not being able to have intercourse. In actual fact, it is a pelvic pain penetration disorder and this is how the DSM-5 defines it. And because it is defined by the DSM-5, it can also oftentimes be covered by insurance. The most important thing that I can say in this regard is that it's not the fault of the woman. There is spasm involving the vagina, and that prevents entry. And so the DSM-5 definition of vaginismus includes the idea that it's a penetration disorder. In fact, my patients very often know from an early age that something's wrong because they can't use a tampon. So it's not only tampon, it's even something like a Q-tip, it could be something like a finger, it could be a GYN speculum, and certainly intercourse. There are a number of conditions that can cause sexual pain. And so we have to differentiate between these conditions so that we're treating the right form of sexual pain. I'm going to use some words that perhaps you won't understand. These words are well described in the book that I showed you earlier, and you can read about the different conditions. And these conditions would be vaginismus, vulvodynia, and vestibulodynia. And I'll briefly explain the difference between these sexual pain disorders. So in vaginismus, we know that there is probably spasm in most of the patients involving the entry muscle. And this is exactly where I've been injecting the Botox. But it requires an entire program. The Botox alone will not cure vaginismus. One needs to have a comprehensive program, which I plan to explain a little bit later. Of these three conditions, vaginismus is probably the easiest to treat. The diagnosis of vaginismus is made by history, not by physical examination. These women have so much pain with penetration that you cannot put a finger in there and expect the patient to cooperate. In my experience, the most common symptom is the patient telling me that any penetration, especially intercourse, feels like it's hitting a wall. When a patient tells me it's like hitting a wall, that to me is the spasm of the entry muscle. The finding is that this is like, a, the vagina is like a tightly closed fist. 
if you make a nice tightly closed fist and you try to insert your index finger into that, you can't. It is as much a man's problem as a woman's problem. Certainly the woman has pain. But a man has pain too. A man has emotional pain. A man will say to me, am I, am I, am I doing this right? I don't know. Nobody ever taught me how to have sex. I must not be a good lover. And the men actually blame themselves also for the difficulty with achieving intercourse. The fear and the anxiety can be overwhelming. And when we discuss later self-evaluation, we will discuss how fear and anxiety go into this. A woman will say to me over the phone, I can't imagine ever using those dilators. I'm terrified about using dilators because I know that I'm going to have to use dilators. And later I'm going to explain this when we're ready to start uh, talking about the dilators and how uh, things can be made easier in terms of the dilator. And coming into the end of my career, I began thinking, well, does every single woman need to have Botox? I sort of didn't think so. The people that I treated had tried dilators. They had tried physical therapy to no effect. But that doesn't mean that women can't treat themselves if they're given the proper information. In the same way that I make an evaluation based on pain scores and anxiety scores, that in actual fact, a woman can do that also. And the way that would work is you would create a chart. And you would write down pain and anxiety as two separate areas where you would rate them. And then I'd like you to rate your pain and your anxiety on a scale of 1 to 10. 1 being the least, 10 being the most severe. 1, able to use a tampon. 5, I'm not able to use a tampon well, but with enough time I can get it in and I have a moderate amount of anxiety. Or a 10, where it's just a tampon is impossible, don't even talk about it, it's not going to happen. Can we begin treating this type of a patient with dilators? Can we begin treating for a long enough period of time and progressively enlarging the diameter of the dilator until such time as they can have intercourse. The problem that I found after several years of treating patients is that the number five and the number six were made too long. And in actual fact, the vagina is about three and a half inches in length, so we don't need a dilator more than three and a half inches in length. And so I collaborated with Shelley from Crystal Delights and worked with her in terms of creating Pyrex glass dilators that were all three and a half inches long. And we started with the smallest dilator, the number three dilator. And we made all the dilators the same length. This is the number three. This is the number four. We also developed an ergonomic fit for the vulva so that instead of there being a disc, so instead of there being a disc, this is a much better fit on the vulva. As you're treating yourself, I'm going to recommend that you dilate two hours a day. I recommend dilating an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening if you have the time. If you're rushing off to work, then just do the two hours in the evening. I would like you to sleep with the number four medium dilator every second night. So for the first month, you'll be dilating two hours a day, and you'll be sleeping with the number four medium dilator every second night. You will progress as you're able to, and some women can progress more quickly, and some women more slowly, and sometimes fear and anxiety is still playing a role, oftentimes. This is not a time to attempt intercourse, because you're not ready, and you're not going to be ready until you can dilate comfortably 
to the number 5 or the number 6 for a period of time. And you need to think of dilation as physical therapy. If we go to a physical therapist because we've had an injury and my arm is in a cast, well, my arm will be in a cast for six weeks while I, the broken bone is healing and then the cast comes off, but will I be able to straighten out the arm? No. The arm is going to be still in a stiff state where it was in the cast. The first part of the counseling, I like to discuss using different positions for dilation. Don't be afraid to try lots of different positions. You may want to have one foot on a chair and dilate yourself that way. You may want to get into a squat and dilate yourself that way. And in actual fact, oftentimes what feels most comfortable with the dilator will also be the position of intercourse that's going to be more comfortable. So if a woman is most comfortable in the squatting position, inserting the various size dilators, then the woman on top position would be appropriate for first time attempted intercourse. My patients have taught me that using a vibrator in conjunction with dilation makes the dilation much easier because it relaxes the pelvic floor. When you are ready to start transitioning to intercourse, uh, you want to instruct your partner that you're still afraid of thrusting and you don't want any thrusting. And I do recommend to my patients that when they have intercourse the first time around, that there is no thrusting for at least three or four times. And if you want to practice with a little bit of thrusting, then you can use the dilator to do some very mild thrusting so that you can understand what that feels like. When transitioning to intercourse, just consider all of the things that you did when you were dating. When you were romantic with each other and you dated, what did you do? And use that as a way of relaxing in the evening. You can go out for a bite to eat, have a glass of wine. Turn off the cell phone, turn off the TV. Find a comfortable place where you can be intimate. Take a shower together. Take a bath together. Think about all the things that turn you on, turn you off. Think about clothing. Some women like to dress up. Some women like to dress down. Some men like to see their honey in a see-through negligee. And some men like to see the women naked. And so you need to have communication with all of this in order to begin that process of transitioning to intercourse. And then you get also into the problem of leg lock. A woman will have uh, a, a woman will have a situation where the thighs, pull together. The thighs just lock, and we call that leg lock. And it's uncontrolled, and it is a protective mechanism any time penetration may be attempted. So if we're going to progress to intercourse, then how do we overcome leg lock? By using a position where it doesn't matter if the legs lock. So for example, in my counseling, I've recommended that patients try a spooning position. In a spooning position, entry is from behind, and it doesn't matter if the thighs close. Just about everything that I've discussed is in this book, When Sex Seems Impossible, Stories of Vaginismus and How You Can Achieve Intimacy. It is my feeling that if you want to get started with a program, you can order the book from Amazon or the Kindle version. And you can also order the glass dilators from Shelley Crystal Delights, and her information will be on one of the slides. Shelley will take care of distributing these various articles and educational resources. She will distribute the glass dilators. She's done a nice job with that. The glass dilators are very good. I've used them for years. She'll be distributing the book, and uh, Shelley also has a DVD that I made 
about uh, two or three years ago that we gave our patients on how to dilate. And the DVD covers this topic from a slightly different point of view where they've already had the Botox and they've already had the counseling. But it is a very comprehensive DVD on how to dilate.